start recording now. Okay, well, I'd like to welcome everybody to this 12th lecture uh, on uh, reading Marx's Capital for the 21st century. And the topic will be Capital Accumulation, which is part seven of volume one. Uh, but unusually, I'm going to give this uh, one a subtitle just because of the outrageous situation here in the UK. Um, and we will come back to this hopefully at the end, which is the whole question of small boats and big lies, question of how imperialist Britain is dealing with immigration. But before we get there, hello, can people turn off their mics, please? Before we get there, um, this is uh, what we're going to be looking at, simple reproduction, chapter 23, chapter 24, tw chapter 25. And of course, there will be some comments from me at the end and perhaps as we go through. Uh, this is a, a diagram I use to explain the structure of volume, main parts of volume one. And what we'll be looking at now is capital accumulation as a, as a class relation between working class and capitalist class. And these are the main points that uh, Marx makes. He makes an awful lot of points, but these are sort of ones that I would emphasize. He starts off by explaining how surplus value is converted back into capital and thus is the source of capital accumulation. Um, he makes a very big point, uh, which is not only about the economics, it's about social class relations, that the accumulation of capital is also at the same time the reproduction of its class relation with labor. And a third major point that Marx makes is the, the driving of this, as, as he understands it, is the rising organic composition of capital. And he explains how that becomes actual in different configurations, indeed, and how it reproduces different layers of the working class. So these are all quite significant socially and potentially politically to definitely moving sort of from a purely economic emphasis, if you like, into the this area of class struggle. And if you recall last time, we looked at how Marx made a transition uh, in terms of the wage form from his initial introduction of the exchange of labor power as a commodity for wages, and how after having developed how surplus value changes in its magnitude according to the degree of uh, absolute and relative surplus value, he came back to wages. And he, he explains very clearly how wages are an external uh, form of appearance, which by the essence, the labor capital relationship. So this is a very uh, usual type of development in Marx's argument. He starts with initial appearance, develops it in terms of the essential contradiction. He comes back to the appearance, having explained the contradiction. And then he looks at the actual forms that, that the appearance takes. Now, the same issue will apply to surplus value. And this is the first step in a much broader arc that Marx will take to explain not only how necessary labor, if you like, uh, reaches its appearance, but how surplus labor reaches its appearance in the capitalist mode of production. So here in volume one, he again, he goes back to the contrasting circulation of uh, capital, which contrasts with a uh, simple commodity circulation. Again, he takes us through what is surplus value, but then he comes back to the, how it, if you like, surfaces, comes out in the surface. And in particular, the emphasis is between the distinction between labor power and labor activity once again. And this does all tie up. It's when you see see it when you go through it, you'll appreciate how conscious the design of this whole must have been, because clearly the reproduction of different layers of the working class, unemployed, employed, and so on, also relates quite strongly to the struggle over wages and the, the form that that takes. So it's a very sort of thought through structure that Marx is already giving us. Uh, to go back to the beginning, back in chapter four, you'll remember that this uh, cycle, this is uh, just a representation of money, exchange for commodities, then there's more money, 
and delta m is the difference between the more money and the money that started off with and money becomes capital because it's a, a form of value which is apparently self-expanding and marx uses the, the idea of self-valorization but then what he goes on to show is that this uh, valorization of money making it if you like capital this expansion can only take place if there's a special commodity which is bought in exchange and then is used by capital to increase, to create the source of this delta M, the more money than was started with. And Marx explains this very carefully and very well. So capital is circulating, but comes up with more money. Labor power circulates, but just comes up the, the equivalent of the value of its labor power. And there's an exchange which takes place in circulation, but there's a second exchange which takes place in production. And it's this exchange in production which is the source of the new value, the surplus value of capital. And just expanding that, this is really this is a review of basic ideas which Marx has already given us. Um, if we just expand the diagram, you can see also commodities are involved in this story because the money is what buys labor power, buys other commodities, raw materials, instruments of labor. And the commodities that are produced will have a greater value than the initial commodities and they have to be solved. So the selling of the commodities at the end of the capitalist production process is also an exchange of equivalents in, in in this uh, scenario, right? And so the extra money doesn't come either from the buying of the commodity or the selling of the commodities. It, the new value comes from, uh, the new value comes from the workers who are involved in the production process. And the new value includes the surplus value over and above the value of labor power. So Marx is assuming uh, that commodities are sold in order to realize surplus value okay this is the the transition of form from commodities to money in in the sale process if you like he's going to look at that in a lot more detail uh indeed the sort of whole question of the circulation of capital in volume two okay so it's he's assuming that that takes place for the time being and the second assumption that he makes uh which he will further elaborate again but in volume three is that once the surplus value is acquired by capital, it, we're only talking about industrial capital, really. We're not talking about land ownership, banks, and so on. So we're talking about surplus value becoming industrial profit. Okay, now I just want to locate what Marx is doing here in the broader structure so you can get a sense of what's going on and why we need to study the overall structure. So here we are again, this is where we are in volume one. This is the uh, accumulation as a reproduction of a class relation. Now, what Marx is doing in relation to volume one is he's, he's looking at this from the point of view of production. He's moving from the, the focus of his analysis being an individual capital to being a totality, to being the entirety of the class relation, uh, a capitalist class, the working class, okay? And, um, as already said, he's looking at this from the point of view of a social reproduction as well as an e economic uh, question, right? Now, this is a totality. This is an overall view, but it's not, if you like, the only totality of co the overall view of social capital that Marx considers. It's the overall view from the perspective of production. So Marx will look at this overall view again from the perspective of circulation and a third time from the perspective of how production and circulation combine. And it's really only when we get to this uh, combination, which is really about the syst systemic generation of profit and the rate of profit that we get, if you like, the totality of totalities. And even then, it's not the end because... What Marx then does is he looks at how these different forms of profit actually take place. OK, so what I'm trying to explain here is this is a major step, but the first of three or four major steps in, in Marx's uh, explanation of the capitalist mode of production. OK, he starts off uh, in chapter three with the idea 
uh, of a, a, a circular movement which at the same time moves forward and so the sort of um he he talks about a circle but i guess you're really talking about a coil because there is a movement forward it's simple but it's also reproducing in time and in this initial concept of capital accumulation the money that is made from a production cycle the surplus value does not go into the next production cycle the capitalist spends it they can spend it, 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 it revenue is what Marx will call it right spend it on their yacht or on their horse racing or whatever they might do okay so in this simple case there will be no accumulation there'll be no more capital the second time round than the first time round. so there's no expansion but Marx does this because he just wants to establish some basic concepts and to first of all to establish the concepts but also to show how in reality there's more to it than what he says here and the, the the basic concept he wants to establish is that surplus value is being capitalized that the source of capital is not itself it's the conversion of surplus value into capital and he um what he does is he reworks his concept of alienation for example to explain this because the worker is not just alienating their labor in terms of the product the commodity that they produce which is what would happen in simple commodity production for example is not simply objectification of their labor that's taking place right the the labor which the workers exploited by capital produces includes the surplus labor which produces the capital which dominates the mode of production so this is a sort of a, a greater degree, a qualitatively further sense of what alienation is for the working class, right? They create the very power, their efforts create the very power, oh, which... No, no, no. Could, could Oliver, could you please oh, mute users? This is not uh, fair on me that there's noise going on. The working class and the capitalist class are both being reproduced by this process, okay? Um, and so the working class needs to be maintained for this relationship to go forward. It, so Marx is emphasizing the indispensability of the working class to the capitalist class, okay? Uh, but at, at the same time, Marx makes this comment here. He says the capitalist may safely leave the reproduction of the working class to the self-preservation of workers themselves. His, his concept of the worker is by default, the male worker, male adult worker. And there is a gap in Marx's analysis. And as I've said before, I don't think in principle, um, uh, filling the gap would invalidate his analysis, but it is certainly necessary to fill the gap and it certainly would uh, develop and strengthen his analysis. Because in actual fact, the self-preservation and propagation of the working class is largely carried out by working class women. And it is their domestic labor which is involved in this. So the, the changing of uh, an exhausted worker at the end of the day to a refreshed labor power in the next day, or indeed the next week, next year, and so on, next generation, is largely down to the, to the work unpaid of, of women in the working class. So uh, Marx is pointing out that from the standpoint of society, um, there's no question that the working class is needed, right? Uh, the working class, even when it stands outside the direct labor process, is just as much an appendage of capital as the lifeless instruments of labor are. And I mean, he gives an example where the English ruling class couldn't let, um, when the cotton famine was on because of the civil war in the United States, there was a lack of cotton, workers were out of work in Lancashire and Cheshire. And so, but the ruling class made sure that the workers couldn't run away <laughs> because they wanted to make sure that when the cotton became available again, so the workers would be there to keep on producing. This diagram is just trying to emphasize one point, which is this is a relational totality. OK, I spoke about the concept of totality, an overview of everything fitting together, uh, together in a sense of 
a total relation. So the capitalist process of reduction seen as a total connected process, as a process of reproduction, produces not only commodities, not only surplus value, but also produces and reproduces the capital relation itself. Now, when Marx uses the term capital relation, I think in every case I've seen, you could say capital labor relation. It's reproducing the relationship with labor. On the one hand, the capitalist, on the other hand, the wage laborer. OK, uh, chapter 24 has got four sections. I think that sections one and four are really very interesting indeed and require, you know, reward, I should say, uh, a lot of attention. Uh, the generalization that Marx is making here is that commodity production only becomes generalized when labor power itself becomes a commodity. But what he's also going to argue is, is that when that happens, it changes what is understood by the law of value. OK, so this is a I'm going to explain in a bit of detail, but you'll read it and study this in, in more closely uh, what he's getting at here. So there's an inversion going to take place. Right. OK, so before we've considered how surplus value arises from capital, now he says we're going to look at how capital arises from surplus value. OK, so this is already one inversion taking place. Looked at concretely, accumulation can be resolved into the production of capital on a progressively increasing scale. The cycle of simple reproduction alters its form and changes into a spiral. So now we have the idea of an expanding production. OK, so this time, the money which comes out of the first cycle, which is increased as it's a capital, so it's an expanding amount of money uh, with the M delta M now incorporated in the M dash, which gets reinvested into the next cycle of, of production, hence the expanding scale. So this is, if you like, the first step of uh, expansion away from just a very simple reproduction on the same basis. So the scale is going to be increasing, but there's also this concept of inversion. The inversion is completely tied up with how surplus labor is incorporated as the substance of the, the, the extra value, which becomes reinvested. And Marx is, explains this in the, in my, I'm not going to read all of this out, uh, but it's a very important idea which he's putting across, right? And I'll just uh, pick out a couple of points from these long quotes, right? He's talking about the constant appropriation by the capitalist without equivalent of a portion of the labour of others, which has already been objectified. So objectified in the commodity form, the commodity has been made, it's a social object, uh, so the labor is no longer in a fluid state. It's in a social object which has its own sort of reality, if you like. Um, but its reality is that it's owned by the capitalist and the capitalist gets the money when they sell it. OK, so what he's arguing here is that the simple property relation where the producer owns the product of their labor becomes inverted. OK, it becomes something else from what we started off with. Uh, only commodity owners with equal rights confronted each other. That's a sort of uh, the sole means of appropriating the commodities of others was the alienation of a man's own commodities. OK, now, however, property turns out to be the right on the part of the capitalist to appropriate the unpaid labor of others or its product. The separation of property from labor thus becomes a necessary consequence of a law that apparently originated in their identity, the separation of property from labor. So the capitalist property claim is on the surplus labor of the workers. This uh, Marx considers as a dialectical progression of the law of value. Uh, and he, again, I'm not going to read all of this out, but I do want you to pay close attention to it. 
So, I mean, it is an interesting discussion about the law of value and the laws of surplus value in the capitalist mode of production. And I think Marx's comments here help us to clarify thinking about this. He does see that in the capitalist mode of production, there is an application of the law of value. Indeed, it's, if you like, the fullest application of the law of value because we've got generalized commodity production. So on the other hand, what we've got is this emergence of um, a, an appropriation of the, the value produced of by one party, the workers, by the other, the capitalists, right? So there is actually a question of, does the law of value as it operates under capitalism, is it the same as the law of value as was initially introduced uh, under simple commodity production? Is it a modification of it? Is it a supersession of it either? even right and the answer that marx really advances is he uses this sort of concept of a dialectical inversion right so it is a development and again this idea of uh, what starts off as one thing becomes something else okay and this is clearly the case in terms of labor and property he's already established that right so what he's saying here is and again i'll just try to be a bit selective because of time uh, on the surface, we have an equal exchange still because we've got in circulation the workers selling their labor power, the capitalists buying it. OK, so this is this is also why it's so important that Marx uses the dialectic of essence and appearance, because capitalist reality is actually like this. Right. And he's trying to explain the reality underneath the surface reality, if you like. So there's pr what is really going on? OK, so on the surface, we've got an exchange of equivalents, OK, corresponding to commodity production. But with the real exchange or the further exchange in production, right, we have this inversion taking place. OK, there we are. To the extent that commodity production, in accordance with its own imminent laws, undergoes a further development into capitalist production, the property laws of commodity production must undergo a dialectical inversion so that they become laws of capitalist appropriation. And this is really about, if you like, the laws of surplus value. Okay, I'm not gonna spend a great deal of time on chat, uh, sections two and three. They do make interesting points. Uh, in section two, Marx is critiquing uh, classical political economy. He develops this particular point an awful lot more um, in volume two. He's critiquing really Adam Smith's misunderstanding of certain points. I'm not going to labor it for now. This one is quite interesting. Uh, so what he needs to consider is that when the capitalist Here's my capitalist here. When the capitalist uh, gets the extra money from their first round of investment, what do they do with it? Well, in practice, if you remember in our first example, simple reproduction, we said they'll, they'll buy their horses and their yachts and so on, right? Um, but in practice, they will buy a, a bit of uh, yachtage, but they will also uh, reinvest. So there's a question of, you know, some of it is consumed as revenue and some of it will be employed as capital or if you like re-employed or put back into the production process. So there we are, there's a missing link in all of this, the horsey. Um, so Marx is just trying to set up a more realistic uh, pattern of what's gonna go on ahead. And the reason he does this is he's arguing it's not true that capitalists are become capitalists because they abstain. You know, he's critiquing a bourgeois justification for capitalism, which is abstinence theory, right? Um, he's basically saying, you know, as soon as you've been through this a few times, even if, even if there was a highly virtuous, abstaining, saving person who became a capitalist, with the reproduction of capital accumulation, their original capital is replaced by the surplus value that they've uh, appropriated from the workers in any case. Okay, now section four of chapter 24 is a really important uh, part of the whole text. Um, it's got a longest title of any section I've seen. Um, so uh, 
the independently of the point we've just made of the proportional division of surplus value into capital and revenue that's the that's the horsey and the capitalist uh, right there's something else right the extent of accumulation right and he actually lists four different factors here so it's getting more concrete in the sense of he's getting closer to the reality of capitalist uh, accumulation the first one is the degree of exploitation of labor power then the productivity of labor, then the growing difference between capital which is employed and capital which is consumed, and I'll explain that in a minute, and also the magnitude of the capital advanced. This is a very big anticipation of what Marx is going to argue as he develops the overall analysis in volume three uh, uh, about the totality of capital. He starts off with addressing another confusion in, in the classical political economic literature, which is that very often um, the degree of exploitation of labor power and the productivity of labor are confused. And he says, of course, in practice, they, they can coincide, um, but they are distinct and uh, one does not reduce to the other, right? Um, so in other words, one, it can be the case that the productivity of labor is increasing at the same degree of exploitation, but it could also be the same degree of productivity, but an increase in the uh, exploitation of labor power. This is a really important point because here Marx acknowledges that what, I, what I've been sort of harping on about quite a lot is that he's always been assuming up to this point that the surplus value, his analysis of the production surplus value has been assuming all along that wages are at least equal to the value of labor power. Then he says, and this is a key statement from, from the perspective that I'm arguing, the forcible reduction of the wage of labor beneath its value plays too important a role in the practical movement of affairs for us not to stay with this phenomena for a moment. Well, I would say the moment's lasted quite a long time and is still with us today, because in the reality, of course, there are lots of uh, real forcible reductions of wages below the value of labor power. In fact, it transforms the workers' necessary fund for consumption within certain limits into a fund for the accumulation of capital. And he, he gives several examples, which because of space and time, I'm not going to elaborate here, but they are interesting. And in particular, once again, he, he writes about not about the factory, but about domestic industry, mostly uh, young women and children involved there as the workers. So what we have, just to reinforce this point, are four variables now, all of which will affect the amount of surplus value that can be available for accumulation for variables okay right comment on the interpretive literature i haven't done this a lot but i would say I'd, i'm interested in what the various sort of influential guides to reading capital have to say about this and two of the major ones don't say anything at all about it that's fine rick and fine and sad Philo's books uh, David Harvey does mention the examples, but he doesn't at all write about the concept of forcible reduction of wages. OK, and rather he sort of switches the discussion to crit 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 criticize Marx because he's saying that what Marx should have been looking at here is uh, the, the lack of effective demand, which is a completely typical uh, comment from Harvey, which for me just indicates uh, the general nature of his contribution, which I summarise as a sheep in wolf's clothing, because what he's trying to do is, if you like, social democratise Marx's argument. We've not got forcible reduction, we've got lack of consumer power, basically. Uh, Tuner uh, does fare a bit better, uh, but we'll see that there's also an issue with the uh, Joseph Tuner's use of this, right? He does acknowledge that wages can be pushed below the required uh, level to reproduce labor power. Okay. And you've got the quote, which I've just quoted, right? Then he goes on to comment, right? 
this is Tuna now, not Marx. Of course, this can only happen for a time because ultimately workers will cease to be able to reproduce themselves. So in other words, capitalism cannot allow this or, uh, you know, there's a sort of a suggestion that it can't really be uh, a part of the normal functioning of the capitalist mode of production. There is a sort of a, a mistake here is the, I mean, increasing the rate of surplus value does not in fact mean that more value is being produced. What it means is that more surplus value is being appropriated. Okay, the distinction there is quite important. Uh, more exploited workers aren't necessarily producing more value, but they are producing more surplus value for the capitalist, which is, you know, what the capitalist is really in the end most interested in. Okay, so what Tuner is missing is actually, well, um, ultimately, we have got a condition where some workers have been obliged to reproduce themselves at a lower standard of living, less life expectancy, living under more oppressive conditions. Okay, And this is really important when we come to international comparisons, because uh, uh, Tuna, who, who represents a sort of, is typical of orthodox Marxism in this respect, right? He only considers the way to make international comparisons is using the two variables of intensity and productivity. And he actually makes use of uh, an example which Marx gives about an English spinner with masses of machinery producing many more uh, you know, yards of yarn than a Chinese spinner. But the whole point is, of course, the comparison has to include, as Marx at for once at least in this very uh, section of this very chapter began to bring in the question of a higher degree of exploitation as also being a potential point of comparison. Unfortunately, I mean very rarely, uh, hardly at all does Marx actually make that comparison, but the comparison certainly needs to be made, okay? And it is made, and this is why the literature in South America, Latin America is so important, it is made by Marini, uh, by the Marxist Dependency School, Marini's book is so important, just been published and so welcome. Everybody should be reading Marini's book, by the way. Um, and, you know, we are beginning to develop an argument based on this, this argument in relation to how important forcible reduction of wages is for understanding capitalism today. So um, Marx in chapter 24 broadens the discussion uh, there are different levers of capital expansion. He doesn't really develop much on the point about forceful re reduction. It's kind of like a sort of a window and then things move on again. You know, the sort of the story continues and it moves on to other issues. Right. But it is interesting, completely uh, uh, profound, really, what Marx says about this. He says what he's trying to get at is that a functioning capital can draw on even more resources because of its control and ownership of the means of production than its own money capital. Uh, and he, he emphasizes this not, is not only a labor power, but also nature or land, if you like. I mean, it can incorporate into itself the natural fertility of nature. And Marx is quite clear about this. So he says the increasing productivity of labor is accompanied by a cheapening of the worker, as we have seen, and it is therefore accompanied by a higher rate of surplus value, even when real wages are rising. Now, I think you'll remember this. This is this was a very important uh, part of Chapter 17, the changes in the magnitude of uh, surplus value. And this is a case which Marx uh, explained. He could have explained there more fully, actually, but he does draw our attention to it, right? Which is it's quite possible as labor productivity increases for at the same time, workers to be more productive of use values and uh, be more exploited, okay? Uh, and this is the case which time and time again, Eurocentric Marxism sort of focus on as being, if you like, the principal case of the capitalist mode of production. Okay. Um, now Marx brings in, uh, again, the greater exploitation of natural wealth. Uh, yeah, I think I've kind of made this point. Uh, uh, let me just check, yeah, okay. 
So this is another point where I've got a lot of sort of conceptual development here. He, he's sort of bringing a lot of threads together now, okay? Labor transmits to the product the value of the means of production consumed by it. On the other hand, the value and mass of the means of production set in motion by, by a given quantity of labor increase as the labor becomes more productive. Now this movement we've seen time and time again in chapter 15 on machinery and large scale industry. This is a very important uh, dynamic, okay? So Marx is talking about how capital can augment its capacity to accumulate, okay? And there's, again, there's several points here. And once again, um we come to a second uh a second rendezvous of the question of inversion right i mentioned earlier the difference between capital employed and capital consumed right what marx is talking about here is the increase in fixed capital so capital employed will be the capital that's invested in the machines uh the raw the raw materials not so much, sorry, not the raw materials, the uh, buildings and so on. And the capital consumed will be the capital which circulates such as the raw materials and the capital invested in wage labor, okay? And so what he's saying is more and more of the capital will have to go in, onto the fixed side uh, as productivity increases, right? This is a really important part of his argument when it comes to the question of the transformation of simple exchange values into costs and profits, uh, because profits for capital are actually measured against the totality of the capital employed, not only the capital consumed, right? Okay. And once again, he's talking about wage uh, labor being alienated. Now, this inversion that I've already mentioned will eventually come out in the form itself of the commodity. Okay, this is what he's hinting at, but doesn't develop here. Uh, this one is quite short, uh, really, and doesn't need to be detained us very long, um, except that he makes this really crucial point about Bentham talked about the labor fund and Bentham considered this to be a fixed amount of money. And Marx said, no, it's not fixed. I mean, capital can actually, uh, rather than saying like there's a pot of money and all of that money will always go to the workers, he's saying, no, it's quite under, uh, conceivable. And indeed it happens that capitalists will raid the workers pot and they'll take a higher degree of exploitation. They'll have a higher, lower wages, higher rate of surplus value. And Marx actually argues that capital has used this as a source of funds in order to expand its operations overseas. So this is a really interesting point because it's a prescient moment, 1870-ish, uh, depending on which, uh, which edition of volume one we're talking about, uh, the beginning of what's known as the phase of modern imperialism. So you've got not only the export of commodities, but the export of capital. The other interesting thing, by the way, is this is funded by the English workers at, at this point, is Marx's argument. OK, now we come on to, we're back halfway. <laughs> we now come on to the major chapter 25, and I'm really aware of time now. So once again, I'm on a slight speed. No, I think I'm OK, right? Value composition. Uh, the composition of capital is a con an important concept for Marx. He basically says, well, look, a capitalist is going to invest a certain amount of money. They're going to invest a certain amount in the means of production and another uh, part they're going to invest in labor power. And the ratio between those two things he calls the value composition. The value composition is also uh, related to the material composition because the material side is the use value side, if you like. So you're gonna have a certain amount of machines, you're gonna have a certain amount of working people uh, and they have to work together. Okay, so that's the materiality of production. And Marx has de developed the idea of organic composition in so far as the value composition is determined by the technical composition and, and 
reflects it basically so that's you know the bigger the machinery is the bigger the buildings are the more the more materials are the higher will be the organic composition and he's interested in this really at the level of the totality and his totality is actually england really in almost every case right um how are we doing reproduction of a class relation I'm actually going to skip this uh, for time purposes. You can read it, right? This is a really important point now, the next big point. The capitalist law of population. Before Marx, famously, Marx and Engels both hated Malthus because of his old reactionary view of uh, people being superfluous. Um, what Marx is saying is that the absolute movements of the accumulation of capital are reflected as relative movements of the mass of exploitable labor power. And it's that which seems to be uh, producing the latter's own independent movement. So it seems to be that population is uh, the independent factor, but in actual fact, it's capital accumulation. So Marx sees laws of population, there are laws of population, but they're specific to the mode of production. So it's a, not a natural law, it's a, in relation to capital accumulation. Okay. He also looks at um, how much wages will rise, and he sees them as being within limits because the mode of production itself would not work uh, if wages were you know beyond went beyond a certain point there would be no surplus value right and he already sort of introducing the possibility of a different way of doing things right but he's definitely seeing this as a uh, the law of wages cannot in and of itself higher wages will not get rid of capitalism is really what he's saying here Okay, now we get on to the development of his concept of population. Uh, as the composition of capital grows, which is a, a function of greater productivity of social labor, this, this can mean two things, right? It can be increased uh, machinery or it can be increased raw materials. And as productivity of labor grows, and indeed uh, fertility will also increase some of this, you get an increase in the composition. Now, what he says here is that the value composition is quite typically has uh, in the spinning industry, for example, in his day was already about seven eighths of the investment that capitalists made would be on constant capital and only one eighth on variable capital. Okay, so a lot of investment in machinery and raw materials in particular. Um, Okay, so there's an awful lot of more masses going through, but he's saying if you actually looked at the mass of raw material, the, the amounts are actually hundreds of times greater, hundreds of times more cotton was being spun, basically. So there's an increase in the value composition, but it's not as great as the tremendous increase in the technical composition of capital, the material composition of capital might be another way of saying it, right? Marx makes another conceptual development, which is he distinguishes between the concentration of capital, which is, if you like, an individual capital accumulating, getting bigger and bigger of its own accord, uh, exploiting the workers under its command of an individual capitalist. And what he sees as a result of in increasing competition is that some capitalists start taking over other capitalists. So the size of the capitals involved get dramatically much bigger. And this is, um, if you like, a conglomeration of capitals and attraction of capitals, which he uses the term centralization. So you get a rapidity of the typical size of a, a functioning capital through centralization and again this is was uh, for his time this was very much of the moment he pinpoints the credit system and joint stock companies as the form under which this is taking place so what you have is a movement away from if you like individual top-hatted capitalist families being the functioning capitalist to a, a socialization within the capitalist class of ownership of these joint stock companies uh, so what he's saying again is this is another mechanism uh, which capitalism 
we're not actually discovering this phase, it's rediscovered a form which it originally had under mercantile capitalism, but put it to a new use. And in the, the modern joint stock companies, he sees as the form of industrial capital rapidly expanding uh, more and more. Okay, so then he discusses in more detail uh, what is uh, the relative surplus population. Basically, as capital accumulates and there's a relatively less variable capital and relatively more constant capital, all the time there's an expansion. So there's an increase, but also at the same time a relative change. Okay, so what you get as a spontaneous generation of the reproduction, the capitalist mode of production, is the generation of a relatively surplus working population or non-working population, part of the working class, which is not actually employed. There is a slight distinction in relative surplus population and industrial reserve army, which it becomes a little bit clear as we go through. The industrial reserve army is the workforce which is immediately drawn in and out of production. And of course, one of the big issues here is the cyclical nature of capitalism, uh, booms and peaks, uh, and sorry, peaks and crises. And so what you get is a pushing out and a pulling in of a workforce according to the where, where capitalism is in its, uh, in Marx's day, 10 year cycle, okay. He goes further than this, right? And he says that basically this begins to reshape what the nature of the working class is. It's not just a quantitative matter, it's a very qualitative matter. And again, he's repeating in a new context uh, points he's made earlier. He's saying that what you see is a much bigger uh, influx or drawing in of women and young people into the workforce by capital. Uh, and he sees these as a way of uh, cheapening of labor power because he sees these as inferior labor powers to the more skilled labor, which uh, he sees as being replaced. And the other thing is about this, we're talking about labor markets now. And what Marx is trying to explain is that capital is working on both sides. Okay, it's not only about the demand for labor power, it's about the conditions which generate the supply of labor power as part of an overall class relation. Okay, so this is a really important, point that Marx is making, a dynamic on the working class overall, and the existence of a reserve army of labour means that on the one hand, some workers are very overworked, those that have employment are sort of uh, obliged to work even harder, and then you've got the ones who don't have any employment at all, okay? And he does relate this to his experience and the experience of the working class. Um, these are not um, these are laws in Marx's view, but they're not laws which are, um, can't be contested. Uh, and he, he does see the combination of workers in trade unions as a positive thing to fight against the worst effects uh, of these laws. But he also sees some other aspects as well. And one of the ways in which capital can sort of release parts of its industrial reserve army uh, or surplus population he knows, and this is particularly true of England in this period, is through emigration, which in effect, he doesn't use this phrase, but it is what it was, white settler uh, expansionism in the, the dominions of the British Empire. So we are now on the different forms of the uh, relative surplus population, uh, which Marx does itemize. I mean, these are discussed in quite a lot of the literature, floating, latent and stagnant. And they're sort of different social situations in relation to this general overall pattern. The real point is, is that the increased competition between workers has been brought about nothing to do with the personality or the social habits, what have you, of the working class, but because of the objective structural conditions which workers have to contend with and face. A uh, section of the working class is continually in pauperism, and some of 
these workers are generally unable to work. And this is a sort of a slight extension of the idea of industrial reserve army into a idea of for capitalism, a surplus population, which is sort of people, writers are coming back to this idea now. I mean, the idea of a capitalism actually wanting to destroy whole sections in a genocidal way of whole sections of the world population, right? So what is Marx's general law? Marx's general law is that the higher productivity of labor, the greater is the pressure of, on, of the workers on the means of employment, the more, more precarious therefore becomes the conditions for their existence and this generation of an industrial reserve army. Okay, these are sort of, it's not down, it's a sort of a paragraph, if you like definition rather than one sentence, right? And of course, overall, what we've got is the accumulation of wealth at one pole and the moral degradation and misery at another pole. And so again, he's emphasizing the antagonistic character of capital accumulation. Okay, the next sections, and I'm gonna go on for about another 10 minutes or so, um, illustrate with a lot of detail um, from different angles what this means if you like these are case studies or empirical analyses based on his overall analysis okay and he gives examples from england in particular he gives examples from how overcrowded and badly fed uh, he also begins to bring out the the effects of this which we'll come on to of the poorest section of the english working class and the Irish uh, workers coming into Britain because of what's happened in their country. Okay, so he's looked quite carefully at the conditions of the working class. He also includes uh, two other sections. The nomadic population is what would be called navvies in you know in our sort of idiom. As they're workers who move from place to place, uh, haven't got fixed abode, uh, subcontracted. Uh, and they're thrown into one building site after another, and that's how this section of workers live their lives uh, in very oppressed conditions. And he looks at what he calls the aristocracy of the working class. But if you read what he he says and reports on the aristocracy of the working class, it's not uh, labour aristocracy as subsequently developed sort of in Lenin's uh, conceptualization, I have to say, is very much, these are workers who do expect to have a job, but they follow the industrial cycle. And in the troughs of the industrial cycle, they are in debt. I mean, they are in very bad conditions. So this is the best of the working class is still in, the, in very bad conditions indeed. And even the best of the best, which is what the capitalist class, these days they talk about the Nordic countries. Well, in those days they talked about Belgium as being the best example of the system working. And so Marx had a look at Belgium and he found that half the working class nearly were in, in dire poverty. So that at this stage, the aristocracy of the working class was not so aristocratic as uh, had it a permanent, it wasn't elevated above the effects of the crisis. It was also plunged into distress in the during the industrial cycle he has a lot on the conditions of workers in agriculture in england very um tough conditions and again incredibly contemporary his discussion of the gang system subcontracted groups of workers uh who are you know move from farm to farm work under peace conditions uh very tough tough life for them okay so he's basically explaining a broader scope uh, including the development of capitalist agriculture and its effects on the working class and the working class revolted in you heard of the luddites and probably of captain swing my one picture for a time okay now i want to just uh, i'm in the last five minutes or so right i want to tell you very important what marx has to write about ireland he documents the catastrophic depopulation. He explains why this has taken place, which is the, a shift into capitalist agriculture. And he looks at how much money the land and uh, factory owning classes make. And the biggest category of property income 
was actually from the land. You can see those figures there, massively so. So uh, the land, most landowners were English. Um, so what you've got is a colonial situation. Marx describes Ireland as being part of uh, an extension of England on the one hand, and we'll see on the other hand in a, in a second, right? And what he's saying is this is a transformation because the rather than being consumed by mostly subsistence farmers, more and more of the product is produced for the market. So with the capitalization of agriculture, you have a destruction of small tenant farmers. And this is what's this is the form in which the production of a relative surplus population took in Ireland under colonial conditions. And Marx explains how low paid the Irish workers are. He explains why it's understandable. He gives you like a rationale why if you are Irish uh, tenant farmer or emigre, you would hate English land ownership, basically. And much of what he writes about here, you could even see quite a strong connection between a lot of the studies of capitalist underdevelopment in sort of the much later times, including how important it was that there were workers from Ireland went to the United States and kept families alive through their remittances, for example. Uh, wages are just as low, the oppression of the laborers has increased, misery is forcing the country towards a new crisis. So what you've got in Ireland is an extension, but also difference with how the the general law of accumulation works. And in especially, this is the closest Marx comes to politics, I would say, in the whole of this long chapter. Mostly the conditions of the working class are, are put in social terms, but he ends the chapter with drawing attention to the significance of the Fenians. The Irishman banished by the sheep and ox reappears on the other side of the ocean as a Fenian. That is somebody fighting for national liberation. And there a young but gigantic republic, the Irish Republic, rises more and more threateningly to face the old queen of the waves, that being, of course, Britannia. There's a huge uh, discussion to, to, to follow on the basis of Marx's general law of accumulation. I mean, I know I'm tight on time now, so we can leave this for discussion, but it's very important how we think we might uh, apply the general law of accumulation or develop it for today's conditions. And I'll just make one uh, couple of last comments, okay. A lot of Marx's writing on this wasn't pure theory in the sense that he drew a lot on political experience, and in particular the political experience of the, what was became known as the First International. The First International did organize against competition between sections of workers. And it did manage to unite English and uh, French workers, but it failed to unite English and Irish workers. And that's the, really the story of the First International in, the, in a nutshell. So this has a very big effect on Marx's writing. He begins to also see that he's not going to finish the, the book of six, the six books that he planned. So I think he does bring in quite a lot of this stuff about wages and the working class um, into volume one, but he never really develops much this question of forcible reduction. And it is left to Marini and others to really take forward what Marx had to, uh, you know, where Marx left it and push it further forward. Um, yeah, I've talked about totality and the three different ways in which there is a totality. It's only when you get to the third one in volume three that the necessity of crisis becomes really, uh, you know, a product of Marx's analysis. Okay, and uh, this we can discuss also. Okay, that is it. Thank you for your attention. Uh, I think I've been going on for nearly an hour now, and that's probably enough for you. Okay, thank you. So Oliver, are you there? We can stop recording.